people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. China has for decades committed atrocities against Tibetans and have uprooted the Tibetan people from their own land. Tibetans have long faced countless enforced imprisonments, custodial deaths, relocation of nomads, destruction of several cultural sites and monasteries, extensive CCTV monitoring and separation of children from their families under the name of re-education to assimilate their cultural identity. Beijing claims sovereignty over Tibet, while Tibet insists that it has always been an individual entity, separate from China. Join us as we take a closer look at the underlying history of the China-Tibet conflict and see how the international community needs to do more to recognize an independent Tibet. Expressing their anger and resentment against Beijing's atrocities continually committed against Tibetans. These activists from the Tibetan Youth Congress and the National Democratic Party of Tibet opposed Chinese Foreign Minister Chin Gong's visit to India during the G20 summit in New Delhi. The Tibetan activists demanded that the G20 nations protect Tibetan children who have been forced into colonial boarding by Beijing. According to a recent report by the United Nations, roughly one million Tibetan minority children in China have been separated from their families and placed into government-run boarding schools. They are forced to complete a compulsory education curriculum in the Mandarin Chinese language with no access to their traditional or their culturally relevant learning. The UN report also noted that these government schools do not provide for substantive study of Tibetan language, history, and culture. If you look at the recent kind of policy, the colonial boarding school, which is the new policy introduced by the CPC to turn, to, to brainwash a very young, innocent Tibetan student, especially the children, at the very young age of five, they were forced to attain the Chinese colonial school, that to a boarding school. Beijing opposes any political and spiritual activities of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Living in exile in India, the Dalai Lama continues to work to protect the rights of the Tibetan people. While imparting his preaching in Bogaya recently, the Dalai Lama criticized China for its disastrous and unsuccessful attempts to destroy Buddhism in Tibet. System that is trying to um, seize the Dharma as uh, like a poison and try to destroy it, but and uh, completely. But they are not successful. And so instead of that. There is newfound interest in the Dharma in China. Despite Beijing's resistance and best attempts, the world is gradually beginning to recognize the Tibetan cause, and there is increasing pressure on Beijing to safeguard the sovereign rights of the Tibetan people. The U.S. Congress, in its Tibetan Policy and Support Act of 2019, passed a bill asking the Department of State not to authorize any new Chinese consulates in the United States until a U.S. consulate had been established in Lhasa, Tibet. Congress also reauthorized the Office of the U.S. Special Coordinator for Tibetan Issues to ensure that the next Dalai Lama will be appointed solely by the Tibetan Buddhist faith community. The bill also requires the State Department to discuss U.S. efforts to promote the human rights of the Tibetan people. Beijing is desperate, however, to keep its stranglehold on Tibet due to its geographically strategic importance. As Beijing aggressively pursues its One China policy, the repression in Tibet is expected to intensify. The emerging threat to Tibetan identity, 
cultural and religious beliefs immediately requires the world's urgent attention. Moving on. It's been weeks since Sri Lankans have been protesting against taxes that were imposed by the government in line with steps taken to meet the prerequisite IMF conditions for loan approval. People, however, say that Colombo's call has only worsened their plight as they were already struggling to make their ends meet. The government, which has time and time again tried to defend its decisions, now stands at crossroads. For one, it faces a colossal challenge in the form of swelling protests by the day, and another, it needs to do debt restructuring and take tough tax calls to ensure it receives adequate support to get its finances up and running. A large number of Sri Lankans cutting across professions took to the streets of Colombo and demonstrated against the soaring living costs. The island nation of Sri Lanka has been grappling with its worst ever financial crisis that has taken a toll on almost every aspect of people's lives. A number of similar protests have been seen in past two months. Inflation that has been hovering over 50% for months, a massive shortage of foreign exchange and steep recession have seemingly pushed Sri Lanka into an unending wave of crisis. The Sri Lankan government, however, faces even bigger challenge for the country cannot emerge from crisis unless it takes tough financial calls and establishes a satisfactory fiscal foundation. As per IMF rules, a country that applies for IMF bailout program has to present debt restructuring model as guarantee. In a bid to meet these prerequisites, the government hiked the country's income taxes by up to 36% and raised power tariffs by two-thirds a few weeks ago. People on the other side said they were suffering due to the poor policy making and imprudent fiscal decisions of the government. So in the central bank, today uh, we are functioning only very limited functions related to the treasury and government uh, treasury bill and bond auctions. So we have a total staff of about 1,250, out of which 1,200 are actively engaging in the, this trade union action. The government has been finding it hard to contain the wave of protest that has already spiraled out of control in many regions. Recently, thousands of members from 40 trade unions didn't either go to work or took sick leave to protest against the government and demanded rollback of taxes. While ships encountered delays at Sri Lanka's major port as a result of workers suspending operations, railway drivers refused to report to work, stranding travellers. The administration delayed exams because most teachers stayed at home and closed the schools. Post offices and state-run banks were also closed. Even though patients were being turned away from government-run hospitals, necessary services like emergency care continue to be provided. At the moment, the strike action is going on in every hospital of the country and we have accepted the uh, strike action from uh, maternity hospitals, children's hospitals, uh, cancer hospitals and other specialized care units so that the people, uh, the effects to the, uh, the patients will be minimized. Sri Lanka no doubt has made progress since it touched the lowest point of the crisis earlier when Gotabaya Rajapaksa was at the helm of Sri Lankan affairs. However, the citizens of the country haven't recovered from the massive financial blow they endured during the course of the crisis. They say their life has become increasingly unstable in past couple of years and if the government doesn't roll back its calls, they will have nowhere to go to and no one to look to. Moving on. With shared values, similar ambitions and common threats, India and Australia are ideal partners to address and tackle the intensifying global geopolitical climate. As China's expansionism continues to pose a major threat to global peace, it also becomes incumbent upon regional powers to mount a resistance. Here too, India and Australia fit the bill. Recent trade and economic breakthroughs have further added to the bilateral prospects of the two countries as allies. 
Join us as we explore the entire gamut of ties between Delhi and Canberra and explore the possibilities of a comprehensive partnership that can prove extremely fruitful to both Indians and Australians and the rest of the world. The India-Australia rivalry is one of the most eagerly anticipated and cherished competitions in the world of cricket. The two sides are also regarded as the best in the world when it comes to creating champions and generating revenue for the game. Such has been the impact of cricket in these two countries that cricket diplomacy has been the guiding component and has provided an intangible head start to all forms of joint negotiations and endeavours. India and Australia signed a historic trade deal last year when they gave each other nearly entire tariff-free access of their markets. The Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement, or ECTA, an interim trade arrangement until a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement is signed, came into effect in December last year. ECTA allows both sides preferential treatment in each other's market in the sectors in which they are major exporters. Since ECTA's implementation, India has been effectively paying zero tariffs on 96.4% of its total exports to Australia. On the other side, Australian exporters pay a significantly lower duty on as many as 125 lines of export. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese recently said that both sides were working overtime to finalize a comprehensive trade deal, and he was hopeful that it would be accomplished before year end. We also agreed on an early conclusion of our ambitious, comprehensive economic cooperation agreement as soon as possible, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to finalise that this year. This transformational deal will realise the full potential of the bilateral economic relationship, creating new employment opportunities and raising living standards for the people of both Australia and India. The bilateral trade between the two sides stood at 27.5 billion USD in 2021. While India primarily exports consumer goods, she imports a significant amount of coal, aluminum and gold from Australia. With a trade agreement in force, the trade figures are projected to touch the mark of 45 to 50 billion USD in the next five years. India and Australia are also working to ease the mobility and migration of skilled workers. Apart from the bilateral paradigms, the India-Australia relationship holds great significance in the global geopolitical context as well. This is especially true at a time when the entire Indo-Pacific region is staring at grim and dangerous consequences of Beijing's expansionist approach to foreign policy. Pradhanmati. एलबीडी जी और मैं इस बात पर सहमत है कि हमारे द्विपक्षीय संबंध वैश्विक समुदायों वैश्विक चुनौतियों से निपटने के लिए और वैश्विक कल्याण के लिए महत्वपूर्ण है मैंने प्रधानमंत्री एलबीडी जी को भारत की जी20 अध्यक्षता की प्राथमिकताओं के बारे में बताया और ऑस्ट्रेलिया के सतत सहयोग के लिए उनका आभार भी व्यक्त किया। Delhi, Canberra, now part of a broader geopolitical identity, the Indo-Pacific, also comprises half of the Quad, deemed as one of the most powerful and effective security groupings around the world. The two sides have time and time again reiterated their commitment to deepening their defense ties as well. Observers believe that the country's shared democratic principles, along with their powerful military capabilities, can thwart Chinese ambitions. We both depend on free and open access to sea lanes in the Indo-Pacific for our trade and for our economic well-being. And we share an unwavering commitment to upholding the rules-based international order and ensuring the Indo-Pacific is open, inclusive and prosperous. Prime Minister Albanese's recent visit, 
which came just days ahead of Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's visit to India, has been seen by many as part of the efforts being made to strengthen the quadrilateral alliance of the United States, India, Japan, and Australia. Although the Quad countries haven't explicitly declared the grouping's agenda, observers are hopeful that this cluster of countries will be able to counter Chinese games in the Indo-Pacific. While New Delhi has maintained a strategic silence on any military aspect of Quad groupings, she is being seen by many as the leader of the Quad grouping for different reasons. Firstly, for India's strategic location and proximity to China. And secondly, for its mighty military capabilities. New Delhi's actions and statements, however, have vividly underlined her intent and objective of ensuring her people both security and prosperity, rather than engaging in conspiracies or confrontations. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Israelis continued to protest and took to the streets of Tel Aviv last week as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected a compromise deal for his government's planned judicial overhaul. In what they dubbed a day of resistance, demonstrators blocked roads in Tel Aviv and clashed with Israeli police. The hard-right government strive to limit Supreme Court powers while increasing its own power in selecting judges has caused alarm in Israel and abroad about the country's democratic checks and balances as protests have swelled for weeks. Netanyahu's nationalist religious coalition says Supreme Court too often overreaches and intervenes in political matters it has no mandate to rule on. Defenders of the court say it is a bastion of democracy, protecting rights and liberties. Economists, legal experts and former security chiefs have warned that the judicial plan, which has yet to be written into law, will wreak havoc on the country's economy and isolate Israel internationally. Netanyahu, who is on a trial for corruption charges he denies, says it will strengthen democracy and boost business. Members of his coalition driving the changes hope to win parliament's final approval by April 2. Japanese firm NTT Communications has presented its latest achievement in the form of a cooperative project called Open Hub. This project aims to solve the problems of decreasing labor power, succession of skill, and diversity of work style. Since its establishment in October 2021, Open Hub has grown to a group of 1,300 companies, 3,000 researchers, and 400 entity staff. They are called catalysts, which loosely translate to connecting people. With the help of digital human technology, NTTCom has developed a human-like face and talking avatar called Khan. She is the 401st catalyst. Her face is composed of nine entity com catalysts. Her voice and motion are produced by AI. Catalyst Miss Con will be appearing at events, shows, company receptions, and clothing stores in the near future. あの、Through this application, viewers can get statistics on each day's population, gender, age, and where they came from, out of town, out of city, out of prefecture. This data will be useful for various businesses. The fusion of virtual space and real space is progressing. Setting the virtual glass, people can get virtual spaces information with a real image of their avatar. Its avatar will navigate to the destination of the real world. Entity Comp's Open Hub hopes to accelerate cooperation beyond borders, which will contribute in building a better society.
Entity Communications is a representative ICT company of Japan. Utilizing its ICT technology, Japan is now trying to solve the traffic problem. Smart cautioning light for car drivers is set up in Susono City, Shizuka Prefecture. Susono City has developed a promotional experiment to prevent traffic accidents on frozen roads during the winter season. This facility is the first of its kind. NTTCOM is planning to promote its ventures in different countries. It has planned to promote itself in the emerging countries. India's true glory can be seen in its diversity and its ability to beautifully intertwine different traditions, languages and lifestyles in a pot of cultures. Home to a number of tribal communities, authorities keep on organizing different events to promote their culture and lifestyle. So today we take you to the National Tribal Dance Festival in Bhubaneswar city which celebrates the rich and diverse cultural heritage of India. Have a look. Sitting in the Adivasi exhibition ground in Bhuvaneshwar, audiences were awestruck to witness beautiful dance performances as tribes from across the country gathered at the venue to display their traditional dance numbers. This was the view at the National Tribal Dance Festival that showcased the beauty and resplendence of tribal dances from different parts of the country. This was the 12th edition of the festival which was inaugurated in the capital city of Odisha with much fervor and enthusiasm. The event is an annual observance organized by SCNST Research and Training Institute of Bhuvaneswar with support from the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. We had a performance of eight states uh, uh, in this evening. Uh, the uh, participants from Mizoram, Arunachal Pradesh, uh, Himachal Pradesh, Rajasthan, all tribals group from their dances today. Uh, very, active, very captivating dances were staged today. And the purpose of this national uh, tribal dance festival is that the, all the tribals group of different part of this country, they can uh, perform at one stage and the people of other state can uh, meet them as well as they can see the dance, the different dance forms of the tribals. Artists from 14 states including those from Arunachal Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand participated in this three-day dance festival. It was a sight to behold when artists from various parts of the country graced the stage as they danced to the rhythm of folk music prevalent in their regional culture. The artists were decked up in unique and colourful traditional attires that had the audience spellbound and were a feast for their eyes. This tribal, National Tribal Dance Festival is a very, very good program because uh, all the uh, Indian national uh, different state are coming here. And we don't know what, uh, what dance is uh, Maharashtra tribal. And also Gujarat and even uh, Odisha. And now we are here, national, the organization uh, organized this National Tribal Dance Festival. And we saw it. And I think about, uh, I hope that we... We also see and see and see and see and, uh, again. Events like the National Tribal Dance Festival continue to provide a platform for tribal artists to showcase their rich cultural heritage. Along with that, it also helps the culture of Indian tribes reach mainstream. Over the years, events like these that promote tribal cultures are gaining popularity among the masses. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. 
we are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.